Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to another exciting hangout with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. Uh, my name is Joe Grabowski, and for those who don't know, we're all about bringing science, adventure, and conservation to classrooms uh, throughout North America and hopefully beyond. Uh, very excited to have a big group of classrooms joining us from across North America today uh, for our Google Hangout with Jonathan Colby. And I'm going to give Jonathan a little intro, and he's going to take over. He's got uh, a great presentation to share about some of his work. Uh, around the world. So uh, Jonathan's a National Geographic Explorer and he's a PhD student at James Cook University. So he's looking at uh, what's happening with amphibians around the world and for those who don't know they are facing um, an extinction crisis due to uh, fungus called chytrid fungus. So I'm sure we'll dive a little deeper into that today. So Jonathan's been involved in wildlife conservation since he was 15. Um, he's been on over 20 field expeditions um, spanning the globe, so places like Honduras, Madagascar, Hong Kong. Um, the last 10 years though he's been working to prevent uh, the extinction of amphibians in Honduras. So he's just established something called HARC, the Honduras Amphibian Research and Conservation Center, so making science accessible to the public and he does this a lot through his photography. He takes amazing pictures of uh, the species that he works with. They're, they're just a treat to check out and we'll get to see some of them today. So uh, he's using those pictures to raise awareness and, and to show people just what's at stake and what species we could be losing. So uh, Jonathan, thanks so much for joining us today. It's great to have you. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right, so I know you've got a little presentation for us and then uh, after that we'll jump into some Q&A with the classrooms. Sounds great. All right. Okay. Now's the test. Do you remember the share screen? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is it the is it working? You got it. Okay. All right. Well, hello everyone and thanks for joining us today. Um, I'm excited to be here and talk about the world, which are frogs and toads and salamanders. Um, my name is Jonathan Colby. Uh, I'm a National Geographic Explorer and a PhD student at James Cook University in Australia. Um, although I'm originally from New Jersey myself, uh, I'm going to talk to you about responding to the global amphibian extinction crisis and why it's a tough time to be a frog right now. So I study amphibians and the threats that they face around the world. And for a long time, they've been facing habitat destruction, pollution, over-exploitation, so that, that's collection for, for the food trade and the pet trade. Climate change uh, is beginning to affect them. And my main focus is disease. Um, I think disease is a really scary problem because unlike some of these other issues, um, you, can't, you can't stop disease with a fence or with better protection of a forest. Um, it, it, it sneaks around and it's hard to study. Specifically, I study a disease called amphibian chytrid fungus. Uh, it has a really long scientific name, but Trachochytrium dendrobatidis. Uh, that's why a lot of us abbreviate it and call it BD. Um, and what this is, is it's an aquatic fungal pathogen. So it lives in the water. Um, when it infects an amphibian, it's called chytridiomycosis. That's, that's the disease. And what it does to the frog is it, it grabs onto the skin and starts to burrow in and causes a lot of problems because for frogs, their skin is really important. For, for breathing and, and, and different chemical regulation, and eventually it causes little frog heart attacks. Um, one, of the, one of the scary things about this pathogen is that there are almost 7,000 species of amphibians around the world, and it looks like many of those are susceptible to this one disease. And that's why now it's the first wildlife disease that is causing widespread extinction around the world. So what I study is how does this disease spread? How does it move from country to country and can we stop it? Um, we know that this disease can spread between frogs when they touch each other, um, like in that picture right there where when they're breeding they, they grab onto each other. Um, but also frogs when they, let's say, sit on a leaf and walk away, that, that leaf can also become contagious because they, they shed little infectious particles into what they sit on and also into the water. We know that this disease spreads between places when we move frogs that are infected. 
So around the world, we trade a lot of frogs for pets and for research and for food. And I'll talk a little more about that in a minute. Um, and we also move a lot of water and, and soil and shoes and things that could have come in contact with water or soil that has this chytrid fungus. But what I'm really interested in is that there's also some, some places and sometimes when it's, it's really mysterious how it spreads. So this one little fungus, it, it crosses oceans and mountains and deserts. Um, and it's fascinating, but also very scary. Here's a snapshot of where this disease is right now. It's, it's all over the world. It's in about at least 60 countries, and over 500 species of amphibians that have been tested have been found infected. So one of, the, one of the main aspects of my PhD work is to try to better understand how much of this global disease event um, might be caused by humans accidentally versus naturally. Um, and a lot of that that I've been looking at is through the international wildlife trade, um, specifically for frogs. Um, we, we trade a lot of animals around the world every year like I mentioned before, for either for food or for pets or for research. Um, and we know that if we're moving animals that are sick accidentally, that we also move their diseases, and, and that's a, a concern for us. There's very little screening when animals move between countries, um, specifically for wildlife. You know, there's a lot of government regulation for things like livestock and agriculture animals, because if those are sick, um, those directly threaten people because those are things that we eat. But for wildlife itself, um, they don't get a lot of attention right now, and that's something I've been working on. So I also, aside from looking at how Kitchen moves around the world, I also focus in one tiny spot um, called Kusuko National Park, which is a small rainforest in Honduras. And I also am trying to figure out in this one location, how are the frogs doing with this disease? How are they handling it? Um, so Kusuko National Park is a very special place. Uh, it's a rainforest, but unlike tropical rainforests that you might think of when you hear rainforest, this one is on top of a mountain. So it's very high up and cold, and it's actually in the clouds, which is it, it's an amazing place to walk through. Um, biologically, these locations are very biodiverse. For example, this forest is only about, you know, 10 miles by 12 miles wide, yet we have over 100 species just of reptiles and amphibians. Um, and unfortunately, though, there's a lot of deforestation around Central America, and this amazing place is surrounded by deforestation. So it's literally an island of forest in the sky. These are some of the amazing amphibians that we have in Kosuko. We've got about 30 species of frogs and salamanders, and half of those are already endangered. Five of those are found nowhere else in the world, so only on this one tiny mountaintop. So beginning in 2006, so for about 10 years now, I've been studying how the amphibians in this rainforest are, are doing with chytrid. Um, this was when I became a National Geographic Explorer. Um, back in 2006, I was awarded a Young Explorers Grant, um, which is something you all should think about when you get a little bit older. Um, it's for younger scientists um, under the age of about 25 or 26, and National Geographic um, is encouraging young people to get out and explore. Um, and they, they've helped me a lot. So they helped me start my work. And it's, it's very easy to find out if these frogs are infected, because since chytrid lives on their skin, um, we can detect it with a little skin swab. It's almost like a little, little cotton swab that you rub on their hands and their feet. And then we send it to a laboratory, and they look for the DNA of chytrid. And if they find the DNA of chytrid, then we know that that frog was infected. So a lot of what I look at is how many of these frogs have this disease and how bad is the disease in the frogs. We've been doing some other different types of science as well to, to better understand more about these animals. So we've been doing radio tracking to figure out where do these frogs go. So you can see in the upper right-hand corner, what this is is a little radio transmitter with a little waist belt that we made for this frog. And it, it sends out these little beeping sounds that you can only hear with this antenna on the bottom. 
Um, and we can literally follow the animals that are almost invisible to us to understand you know, what kind of habitats they enjoy using um, and, and what they do in the forest. We also are trying to understand better how many of these frogs are in the forest and how many are dying. And that's difficult because to do that you need to know that when you see a frog, who is that frog? You need to individually know all the frogs that you see. Um, and one of the met new methods that we're excited that we've been experimenting with is something called visual implant elastomer tags. And what you can see here, circled in the middle picture, is the teeny tiny flat little rubber tags with a number and a letter engraved on it. And it's basically like a fingerprint for the frog. We, we inject it under the skin. So we make a very, very, very tiny incision. Um, and that, that becomes like a permanent tattoo. So we know when we see this frog again that, that he's surviving. And it also lets us count how many frogs are there. We also started climbing trees to see how the tree frogs are doing. There's some frogs that never, ever need to come down to the ground. So we wanted to know, are they OK as well? Um, we know that Kitrid is lives in the water. So a lot of people concentrate on the rivers. But we also know that that's not to say that the frogs up above us aren't also getting this disease. So we started climbing trees the hard way. And then we went to tree school and started doing it a better, safer, more expert way. And now I'm going to tell you a little bit about our results. Um, first, some good news. Uh, back in 2008, I was extremely lucky and actually rediscovered a frog that was already thought to be extinct in, in Kusuko. It's called Miles Robber Frog. And it vanished in the 1980s. So it has been missing for almost 30 years. And it was thought that it was from the disease event. It, it likely was. And it's, it's very hopeful for us that we, we did find a couple that are hanging on. Um, but we still don't know if they're out of, out of the clear yet. But the bad news is that basically everywhere we looked for chytrid, in the rivers, even up in the trees, we found it. Um, and, and that taught us that there's many more species of animals at risk of this disease than first assumed. So here's the big conservation challenge around the world, is that this, this chytrid fungus, once it gets to a new area and becomes established, we can't get rid of it. Um, there's no way to specifically target killing this one tiny fungus without killing lots of really good other fungi. Generally speaking, fungi are really important for the environment. They help break down dead trees and leaves and, and, and aid in decomposition. So you don't want to kill all the good stuff. We also learned that in Kusuko, most of the baby frogs seem to be dying from the disease. But the few that actually make it and are lucky enough to survive to become adults can, can persist and they won't die because they're stronger and they have a better immune system. So the big question is, can we prevent their extinction? And how? What should we do? So now I'm going to show you a few video clips about what we are doing now in response to this. Chytrid fungus is a microscopic amphibian pathogen. It's one of the first wildlife diseases that has truly gone global by the time we knew it existed. One of the greatest issues with chytrid that makes it so severe as far as conservation is that it can affect nearly any amphibian species. So of the 7,000 known species of amphibians, any one of those could potentially go extinct from this single pathogen. And it's, it's alarming to watch these frogs disappear. We have established the Honduras Amphibian Rescue and Conservation Center, a Head Start and Captive Breeding Program. What that means is that there are certain life stages of the frogs that seem to be more susceptible to dying from chytrid, and that's the tadpoles and the metamorphs. From the long-term work that we've done in Kasuko, we've noticed that 
once they become adults, um, the few that do survive are then resistant. So the activities that we're doing here at Hark is basically removing the weakest animals from the park, which are the young animals, bring them here to our facility at Lancetia, cure them of chytrid, which, which can be done in captivity, and then raise them until they're adults. Uh, and then reintroduce those animals back into Kazuko so they can become part of their ecosystem once again. In my opinion right now, the best long-term solution is to find a way to have these frogs continue to exist in their natural habitats and to continue breeding on their own and, and creating offspring which potentially may become subject to natural selection and hopefully evolve their own resistance. Although the young ones will still be susceptible, um, there will be many more of them around. So a minimally invasive method of assisting evolution and, and letting it take its course but by providing it animals to work with. Doing something about Kitchard means applying the science that we know um, and taking some, some risks. We don't have a template to work from. You know, this has never been done before. And that's part of the reason why we have to take risks and why it's, it's more difficult and complex and challenging is that we can't prove to people that what we're doing is going to work or it's going gonna, it's gonna to fix things because this is a new territory and all we know are the consequences of inaction and that if we don't do something, we're going to have a lot of problems. Martínez Ramírez es el nombre. Yo tengo 82 años. Yo vivo aquí en el parque. Ha cambiado bastante el clima. Ya no es el mismo clima de antes. Porque a hoy ya la cosa ya ha cambiado por causa de que viene más viento, más, más agua. ¿Ah? Más lluvia. Una lluvia así, suavecita. Nada más. Cambio del de, 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 clima y hay cambio de los animales también. Y aquí los animales ya no vienen como venían antes. Antes venían aquí los animales. Muchos animales venían. Venía el tigre, pasaba por aquí el tigre. El danto pasaba por allí, por ese borde, así, por allá. A hoy ya no pasa. Se han terminado muchas, muchas razas de, de ramas. Creo yo que se han terminado. Pues más poco, más poco, menos cantan, ya no se oyen cantar mucho. Como antes que cantaban bastante. Al, al, al ir bajando la naturaleza entonces también ellas van terminando la, la cría de ranas ya no, hay, ya no son las mismas son otras, vienen otras otra clase y se necesita salvarlo porque de repente se terminan frogs because I feel a lot of people don't and it's important to me to work with animals that are often overlooked. They're beautiful and they're interesting and, and they're unique. Um, they're just one of the most fascinating animals I can think of. Welcome to Kasuko National Park in Honduras where together with my partners Omaha's Henry Dorley Zoo and Aquarium we're fighting to save frogs from extinction. Here in Kasuga National Park, a lot of the amphibians are infected with amphibian chytrid fungus, a pathogen that's spreading all over the world. It's in about 60 countries already that we know of, and in hundreds of amphibian species. Most of the animals here in the park that we've sampled have shown signs of infection, and we do believe that a lot of them are declining as a result. Three in particular we're working to save from extinction at the Honduras Amphibian Rescue and Conservation Center. Here at Lancetia Botanical Gardens and Research Institute in Tela, Honduras, I'm with my colleague Brandon Rees from Omaha's Henry Dorley Zoo and Aquarium. And we've been hard at work in Omaha retrofitting some old shipping containers into mobile frog laboratories that hopefully replicate the exact conditions we need to keep these animals healthy, happy, and uh, reproducing. It's very exciting. That's where our Head Start efforts will be taking place. 
the hex sorting efforts will be taking animals out of the wild, tadpoles and early morphlets uh, that are affected by chytrid fungus. Uh, we'll bring them here, clean them up, raise them up to be happy, healthy adults, and then re-release them. Simultaneously, we will also have a second pod, and it will be our assurance colony and breeding efforts. We strongly believe that this Head Start effort will be a very successful way of keeping these animals in the wild, in their habitat, and preventing dramatic population crashes that could cause extinction. And that's where you come in. Um, we need help. Monetarily, uh, it, it's, it's a big thing to ask, and we understand that. Um, but we can't do it alone. We need your help. Yeah, we're entering our next stage of the project, and we need your help to continue to bring capacity to Honduras to help save the frogs. Please come partner with Hark. Thank you. The zoo got involved about eight years ago. Jonathan Colby um, contacted us. Um, saying that he needed help up in Castuco National Park, and we had the capability to help him out. Since we have extensive knowledge and background in uh, animal husbandry and amphibian conservation areas, um, it was a perfect marriage between what he's finding in the wild and what we can do in captivity. So we set up operations in Lancetia. They did offer us a building to, to build our isolation rooms in, um, but it just wasn't going to meet the criteria we needed for biosecurity. Um, we noticed geckos running down the walls and skinks on the grounds and killer bees in the walls, um, and it was just fighting an uphill battle. So we needed to start from scratch and to make it our own. So we decided to use ocean shipping containers. The use of shipping containers for amphibian projects isn't a novel thing, but what's different about our project is that we actually built them up in Nebraska and then shipped them down, com nearly completed. It, it was the ultimate challenge. Like, there were no blueprints for this. We don't know everything about the husbandry and the natural history of these animals, so we tried to make it as versatile as possible. What makes our project stand apart from others is that we have an immediate reintroduction plan. Uh, most other facilities like this worldwide um, take the animals out of the environment, clean them up, get them healthy, but they don't know what to do yet with those animals. So they're basically building assurance colonies, which is important, but we have an immediate release plan. The entire zoo, not just myself, are extremely proud to be a part of this project. Um, to do anything we can to help out uh, is a great honor, and um, I know it's harder to find success long term, but getting these healthy animals back into the environment is our number one priority. So I hope you enjoyed those, those videos that we just finished producing. And the current status of our project is that our rescue facility is now in construction in Honduras. Um, we're currently fundraising to finish building this facility. Um, but we're super excited that in, in the lower right-hand picture, those are our containers that the laboratories are inside of. And just yesterday, they were placed on these concrete foundations. Um, our friends down there just sent us these pictures, so it's very exciting for us right now. And hopefully, we expect that by next summer, we'll have employed some local biologists and trained them and be all ready to start saving the frogs. So now, just to take a step backwards and go back to the bigger picture, you know, if some of you are thinking, okay, I get the point, frogs are croaking, but why should I care? There's a lot of reasons why you should care. Frogs are really important for the environment. They're, they can be thought of as, as river lawnmowers. Their tadpoles graze the algae and other plant matter in the rivers, growing on the rocks and, and on the bottom of the water. And they help keep the water quality up and, and the rivers clean. Frogs also consume a lot of insects that can sometimes spread diseases to people. Um, such as malaria and dengue and, and Zika and other viruses spread by mosquitoes and other insects. Frogs are also really important as a food source for lots of other animals. There's lots of snakes and birds and mammals that rely on frogs and, and other amphibians as a source of food. So if all the frogs disappeared, the other animals would have a lot harder time to eat enough. Also, 
On a lighter note, amphibians are just really important in general for cultural reasons, educational reasons, and they help get children inspired and curious about nature and the environment, and I think that's really important. And to even take a bigger step back, is it just about frogs? No, not really. Protecting wildlife health is important for global health. Every piece of nature matters. Everything has a purpose. Even if sometimes we don't know exactly what that purpose is, it all has a role. Also, a lot of really bad human diseases started as wildlife diseases before they made a jump into humans, such as AIDS and SARS and Ebola. So keeping wildlife healthy is good both for them and for people. And what worries me is that increasing globalization. So globalization means how connected the world has become through planes and ships and moving things really quickly. Um, we're spreading these diseases accidentally, and it's a lot of more opportunities for these things to happen in the future. Um, for example, we have bat white nose syndrome, um, which is now spreading, very similar to how frog chytrid is spreading. And in the wise words of Kermit the Frog, he said, if it seems to me that if you wait until the frogs and toads have croaked their last to take some action, you've missed the point. And I'd like to thank all of you for being here for the presentation, and I'd love to hear any questions you might have. All right, Jonathan, thank you so much. Um, Hark is such a cool project, and it's so important. It's a shame it's necessary, but um, you know, it sounds like it's, it's, it's a step in the right direction. There's some really good science behind it, and it's very exciting to see it coming together, that you, you had pictures fresh from yesterday that uh, those uh, cargo containers are coming together. So obviously, we wish you the best in this project. Thank you. Um, all right, so I'm going to introduce the classrooms, and we'll get some questions. And Jonathan, if you just click the share screen again, you'll come back for us on the, on the camera. Gotcha. All right, so we do have a really great group of classrooms joining us today from uh, across North America. We've got Mr. Wigmore's grade fours. They're from Brampton, Ontario, so not too far from me in Canada. We've got Mrs. Uh, Edgar's grade fours uh, in Hutchinson, Kansas. We have Mrs. Hanlon's grade threes. They're in Freehold, New Jersey. And we also have some grade fives, Mr. Greenfield's uh, from Freehold, New Jersey as well. Uh, Mr. Koshin's six sevens are joining us uh, from Kakabeka Falls in Ontario as well. And then we have Mrs. Dwarf's grade eights are joining us from Taylorville in Illinois. So awesome group of classrooms, lots of students um, learning about what's happening with frogs today. So uh, let's jump right in. Let's go with um, our grade threes. Your microphone's on if you have some questions for Jonathan. Sure, Rebecca Downing. All right, we have um, Rebecca coming on up. You have to stand in front of the cameras. Do you wear special gear when you say frogs? Yes, we do. Um, it's very important for us to wear gloves on our hands when we are saving the frogs um, because this disease that they have is on their skin. And it's very easy for us to accidentally touch a sick frog. And then if we touch another frog, we can accidentally make that frog sick too. So that's one of the most important pieces of equipment for us is gloves to keep the frogs okay. Good question. Let's uh, grab another one. Have you ever been hurt by an animal? <laughs> um, yes, I have. Um, uh, one time I was bitten by a venomous snake in the rainforest. Um, and I had to be rescued by the military in a helicopter to go to the hospital. Um, so yes, be very careful with snakes. Don't be afraid of snakes, but just be very careful with them. All right, and this is our last one. Are amphibians the only animal that can get this disease? That is a wonderful question. Um, we actually thought that amphibians were the only things that could get this disease for a very long time. But recently, to our surprise, we also found that crayfish 
can get it, and so can some little nematode worms in the soil. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a lot more interesting and complicated than we first thought. Okay. Thank you very much. That's all of our questions for today, so thank you. All yeah, right. thank you. Great questions. Um, let's see. Let's go to Kansas and turn on the microphone. Huh, Mrs. Ediger, can you try on your end? It's not cooperating on mine. Okay, maybe it's not cooperating on their end either. Let's jump to um, our grade fives in New Jersey. We'll try to come back to Kansas. Maybe in Kate. Hi, my name is Zach. Um, how many species of animals do you estimate will be extinct by the year 2020? Um, for frogs, we don't know exactly. It's it's difficult to estimate because a lot of species are missing. And what we mean by missing is that there's species in very remote places where they just haven't been seen in a really long time. Um, but it is thought that potentially as many as 200 species of amphibians have or are disappearing right now. So, so yeah, it could, it could be a, a couple hundred species in the near future. Hi, my name's Elizabeth, and I was wondering when did you start thinking about working to protect amphibian extinction? Good question, Elizabeth. Um, ever since I was a little kid, I loved frogs and snakes and lizards and was just really fascinated with them. Um, when I was 15, I started studying them in the wild as a volunteer with some conservation groups. But it wasn't until a few years later when the disease started killing the frogs. And then I got really worried um, and decided that I wanted to save them. So I, I started off just very interested in them. But then when, when they started getting sick, I, I knew I had to do something about it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. You can fire off one more if you have one. Please. You can ask. Okay, that's all. All right. Perfect. Thanks, guys. Um, let's stick with New Jersey. I know. Uh, actually, no. That's both our New Jersey groups. Perfect. Let's go to Brampton. Mr. Wigmore. I can reach your mic now. You're on. All right, uh, Eric. I'm not serious. You're good. Hi, my name is Eric, and how do you think this disease got started, and can it um stop? That is a wonderful question. Um, so I've been studying that for probably close to ten years now. And we still don't really know. Um, we believe that the global trade in amphibians has a lot to do with why this is spreading. Um, you know, so like a lot of the frogs you see in a pet store, or some people eat frogs, like bullfrogs, for food. A lot of these frogs come from other countries. And we think that that's how it moves, and that we might be spreading it a lot. But what's really interesting is that we recently also learned that it's been spreading a lot longer than we first thought. So even before planes existed, it was across several oceans. So we're still trying to figure out why is it that this disease, well, this pathogen, has been spreading for a really long time, but it seems that only in the past, you know, in, in the recent past, things started dying from it. So something changed. Um, and can it be stopped? Um, I don't know. It, it's difficult because right now it's in so many countries by the time we learned it existed. Um, it's, we might be able to stop it from getting to new places. Um, but the real important thing is to just spread it less. So there's things we could do to make things cleaner um, and be more careful. And, and, and that's important. Good question.
We didn't hear you, bud. Can you ask again? Is there any predators of the poison dart frog? Um, there, let's see. I personally don't know of any predators of poison dart frogs other than people. Um, people do collect them for the pet trade. They also use them. Um, but as far as natural predators, I can't think of any natural predators that can tolerate the poison of a po poison arrow frog. Okay, we'll steal one more if you got it. Hi, my name is Miriam, and my question was that did you did you eat organic stuff from trees and bushes, or did you eat stuff from your house? What, what, what was that? Could you repeat that question? Yeah, you um, did you eat organic stuff from the trees and bushes, or did you just bring food from your home? Oh, while, while I was in the forest, we we mostly would go food shopping, and then we would bring all of our food into the forest on big trucks. But it would be food that would be okay without a refrigerator. So a lot of dry things like rice and pasta. Um, but yeah, we, we would have to bring our food into the rainforest. Yeah, that was always something tricky to figure out. Good question. Okay, and our class uh, in Illinois, do you have any questions in Taylorville? Yeah, we have a couple. Um, yes. Um, is there any way that you that well do you think that maybe uh, a student should maybe know about it? Like should we be warned about it? Uh, that was a little bit broken up on my side. Could you could you repeat that? Do you do you think that we should be warned about that, maybe? W warned about what? Like the fungus that's um, that's like wiping out the frogs or the amphibians. Yes, I certainly think more people should know about it. Um, it doesn't seem to get that much attention in the news, but it is very serious. Um, and and I think a lot of more people need to learn about it and and be aware because there's there's a lot of little things that people can do to make it better. Um, even things such as when you go to a forest, if the disease is there, um, you can wash your shoes when you get home. Um, and that can help reduce the spread between different places. And, and there's lots of little easy things like that that I think people would do if, if they knew about this more. So yeah, that was a good question. OK, I have a question for a student who can't really talk right now. Um, but what he wants to know is, in North America, where are the hot spots for this particular fungus? Where, are the, where, do, they, where do you see the disease being in, like, the U.S.? Good question. Um, so in the United States, um, it's been found in most states. It, it's all over the country already. Um, but not all frogs die from it. Um, it, it varies considerably between species and between regions. So in the United States, um, it seems to be more of a problem out in the western part of the country, like in California and up on the north coast, um, where in, in comparison, in the northeastern United States, it, it's highly um, prevalent, but it does not seem to be killing things like it is on the west part of the United States. Um, so yeah, it, it does vary a lot by, by region. And, and that's another thing we don't completely understand yet, um, which is, I'm glad you raised that, is that we still don't know why certain frogs die a lot faster than other frogs. Um, and it, it varies a lot between places and between species. So yeah. Okay, and our last question is, um, are they trying to work on a uh, test where you can 
uh, get a quicker uh, response to whether a frog is affected or not besides the DNA PCR test? That's a really good question. Um, yeah, I mean, right now we're kind of on the cutting edge of, of trying to push those boundaries forward. Um, the time it takes to run the DNA test and the equipment needed um, does slow down the, the, our ability to know like instantly if a frog is sick. Um, typically the test will take a couple days, but labs are very busy, um, plus you have to get to the lab, so it could take weeks or even months before you know if your frog was infected. Um, I have heard of some attempts to make uh, a test that is much faster, um, but right now we, we don't have anything better, so that, that is the best that we have at the moment. But hopefully in the future we could have something quicker. Okay, Mr. Koshin's class, your mic's on. Hi. My question is, is there a way us kids can help? Yes, that is a great question. Um, kids can definitely help um, just by talking about things like this and and being aware and telling your parents. It, it, to me, it seems like kids are much more interested in nature and and the environment these days than, than sometimes the adults are. Um, and I think that's very important to go home and tell your parents about these things um, and get them interested too. Um, but yeah, I think, I think kids these days, it's very important that you care about the environment and about animals and about protecting them because you guys are next, you know? My, my group of scientists are getting old and you guys are the next ones. Um, so yeah, just stay interested and, and talk about these things. And, and that's, that's a huge help. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my question is, um, what was your most favorite place to travel? Good question. Um, I always tell people I, I love every place I've been for different reasons, but I will say that Madagascar was, was the most unique place that I've ever been to um, and, and, and special. It just, oh, man. The Pizza. landscape and the animals were just phenomenal and, and so different from anything I'd ever seen. Um, it was, yeah, Madagascar stands out. But Honduras is very special to me personally because I've spent so much time there. Um, in total, I've, I've lived in the rainforest for over a year altogether. Um, so it's a very special place for me in Honduras. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, my question is, how fast can the fungus spread? Um, it can spread fast. So it's hard for us to give an exact, um, an exact rate because it's hard to follow it. Um, but it has been estimated to move as fast as several hundred kilometers a year. Um, we don't know exactly how that happens, but yeah, it can it can move many miles a year on the edge, and over over big things too. Like it can cross rivers and oceans and mountains. Um, yeah, it's it's fascinating. All right, great questions, guys. In our last class in Kansas, it looks like you're back in. Are you able to hear us? Okay. Yeah, we're, we're experiencing technical difficulties. So if you have already answered questions, just let us know and we'll ask something else. Okay, well, we know all about technical difficulties here. We're glad <laughs> yeah. to have you back. Okay, <laughs> thanks. All right, Dave. Hi, my name is David, and if the baby frogs survive, do they get it again? That is a great question. Um, the answer is yes. So... From my, my own experience with the frogs that I work with, um, that's one of the difficult things that we're trying to discover and figure out is that if the baby frogs survive, they will get sick again. Um, but when they get sick again as an older frog, they have a stronger immune system and they won't get as sick. So it's likely that they will survive 
if they don't get sick until they're older. Um, and, and, and we're hoping in our project that that's going to be one of the solutions, one of the answers, is making sure that the frogs don't get sick until they're older when they'll be okay. So, but, but, that's, but that's a good question because a lot of people have asked about vaccines. You know, like, like people get sick and you get a flu shot and it makes you not get the flu. So a lot of people think, well, could you do that for a frog so it doesn't get sick from chytrid? And there's a lot of people studying this and trying to answer that question. Um, but unfortunately, a frog's immune system is very different than a person's immune system. And it doesn't work as easy. Um, so right now, we, we have not been able to make any vaccines or any kind of shots that you can give a frog. Mm. Thank you. All right, Trey. Hi, my name is Trey, and I've been wondering what is causing the disease? So that is also a great question. Um, so basically, what's causing the disease is something called chytrid fungus. But what we don't know is why. Um, we know that chytrid fungus has existed for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. But it, it seems like only now it's beginning to kill frogs. Um, so we know what's killing it. We don't know why. Um, and that's, that's something we're trying to understand. JD, what you ask you? All right, one more if you guys have one. What frog is the most endangered? Um, there's probably a lot of frogs that would qualify, but one of the most popular ones that we hear about often in the news um, is called Rab's fringe limbed frog, um, and he is a famous frog because supposedly he's the last one of his kind. Um, I believe he's from Panama and he lives in Atlanta, Georgia right now in their amphibian rescue facility. Um, but sadly, after he was discovered, Kittred got to his rainforest and it, it's believed that it killed all of his other friends. Um, so right now that would be the most endangered frog is the one where there's only one left. How about that? One. All right. Well, Jonathan, I can't thank you enough for today. The presentation was great. I Thanks. know you introduced issues that a lot of students maybe hadn't thought about before, although I did see a lot of classrooms were doing research and posting, so that was really cool that a lot of classrooms were really getting ready for this Hangout today. Yeah, um, fantastic. Yeah, but um, very exciting. Um, if you don't mind, uh, just pass me on the links again today so that I can pass them on to the classroom so um, they can follow your research and, and keep up to date with what's going on. I believe they could follow you at uh, MyFrogCroaked on Twitter. Yes. And then what's your personal website? Um, FrogRescue.com. FrogRescue.com, perfect. So, um, Again, thank you classrooms for your amazing questions, for doing that research beforehand. These were some of the best questions. You guys were clearly well researched. And uh, thank you, Jonathan, for tackling this issue for us and, and really making it understandable for a wide variety of kids today. And um, this will be up on YouTube and available for other classrooms to check out in the future too. So uh, very exciting. Um, what we like to do uh, at the end is turn on all the microphones and give the classrooms a chance to say goodbye and thank you. But maybe, Jonathan, I'll give you a moment if you want to say something to the classrooms to wrap up. Oh, not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Sure. Yeah. Thank you so much for, for joining us today. I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to, to talk to you. Um, kids like you inspire me. I mean, I look up to you guys because when you guys get excited and interested in the work that I do, that, that makes, it, makes it special. And it makes it important to me that to see people like you care. Um, because you, you guys are the future, and it's important that you know and understand and, and care about the environment and animals, and that makes me happy. So thank you all very much, and keep asking questions and being interested. All right. Thank you very much, Jonathan, for what you're doing, and keep those pictures coming because they are uh, just some beautiful photography, and it's you're giving people a snapshot of... Um, parts of the world that they would never see and species they probably didn't even know exist. So thank you so much for everything you're doing. Thank you. All right. Microphones are coming on, classrooms, if you want to say goodbye and thank you.
All right. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your afternoons, and we're signing off for today. Thanks, everyone. Oh, she's good.